Bene, buonasera a tutti. Eh, parliamo di pensioni e quindi credo che il professor Tito Boeri, che è qui in prima fila e che è un autorevole economista, converrà che il fatto che ci siano molti giovani ad ascoltare il professor Holzman che parlerà di pensioni è un fatto positivo, riguardando soprattutto il problema, per quanto se ne possa dire, più i giovani che gli anziani che ormai sono arrivati al capolinea. Io mi chiamo Roberto Petrini. Sono un giornalista di Repubblica dove mi occupo di politica economica e io direi di salutare con un applauso il professor Holzman che è uno dei massimi esperti in materia previdenziale, è uno dei massimi esperti in materia previdenziale, dirige a Vienna un importante istituto di politica economica, è un senior advisor della World Bank e ha una montagna naturalmente di pubblicazioni e di, e di libri che si occupano di materia previdenziale e di pensioni. Quindi eh, lo ascolteremo eh, con grande attenzione. Il mio compito, il compito che mi è stato assegnato è semplicemente quello di introdurre in qualche modo il tema eh, per come si è presentato in Italia e mi è sembrato che la cosa migliore da fare fosse quella di andare a vedere il documento di economia e finanza, il vecchio DPF insomma, del, presentato dal governo qualche settimana fa e sfogliandolo e arrivando nelle ultime pagine eh, si trova un grafico che spesso questi grafici sono molto più eloquenti di tante parole. Eh, nel grafico ci sono due linee molto importanti. Eh, giornalisticamente lo chiameremmo il grafico da, che va dalla gobba alla buca eh, perché una linea segna la famosa gobba pensionistica cioè il rapporto che la spesa pensionistica ha nei confronti del PIL e come questo rapporto si è evoluto e si evolverà nei prossimi anni quindi se noi prendiamo eh, osserviamo questa linea sapendo che questa linea con la gobba rappresenta eh, la spesa pensionistica sulla base delle riforme che sono state fatte negli anni 90 e prima del 2004, ci accorgiamo che il picco è del 18%. Se poi prendiamo l'altra linea, quella che io mi sono permesso di definire quella della buca, e ci accorgiamo che la, che la spesa pensionistica scende al 14%. 9% al 15%. Che cosa c'è di mezzo? Di mezzo c'è l'ultima riforma, la riforma Fornero. Non sono poche le riforme che sono state fatte in Italia. La riforma Fornero, come abbiamo visto con la gobba e la buca, è stata una riforma determinante. Ma non sono, non sono poche le riforme che sono state fatte in Italia. E sono andate, devo dire, tutte stranamente in un paese come questo, che una volta tira da una parte e una volta tira dall'altra, sono andate un po' tutte nella stessa direzione. Dal 1992 ad oggi eh, sono stati fatti otto interventi molto importanti. Io ricorderei quella del 92 di Amato, quella del 94 di Dini, quella del 97 di Prodi, poi una serie di interventi in qualche modo del, del, del governo Tremonti Maroni fino a questa, a questa importante riforma della Fornero. Una cosa si può notare, forse questo può essere piuttosto interessante, beh, che il vincolo esterno ha sempre influenzato molto il il cammino della riforma delle pensioni in Italia. Nel 92 Amato ci accorgiamo che allora eravamo in piena svalutazione della lira, in crisi del sistema monetario europeo. Nel 95, quando arrivò la, la riforma Dini, c'era la crisi del Messico. Nel, nel 97, quando ci fu un ulteriore intervento di Prodi, eh, c'era la sfida per l'Italia di entrare, di raggiungere i parametri del, del, dell'euro. Dal 2007 al 2011, quando intervengono le ultime riforme di Prodi, qualche intervento forse un po' pasticciato di, di, del governo di centrodestra, ma soprattutto la riforma Fornero, siamo in piena crisi, eh, crisi 2007-2012, se possiamo definirla così, che è quella che ha investito il debito privato e il debito pubblico nel globo. Quindi, come dire, un cammino grosso, no? importante, eh, non semplice, che è servito eh, sostanzialmente per scardinare due, due leggi, andavo oggi a, a rivedere per, per, per potervi introdurre questo, questo tema. Beh, una del 65 e una del 69. Mm, la prima del 65 introduce il concetto di pensione di anzianità. Dice a 35 anni, quando uno raggiunge i 35 anni di contributi, 
può liberamente andare in pensione al di là del, del, dell'età anagrafica. L'altra del 69 dice eh, per calcolare la pensione dovete utilizzare il metodo a ripartizione, cioè dovete calcolare la pensione sulla base del, eh, della media degli ultimi stipendi. Sostanzialmente il cammino che c'è stato dal 92 ad oggi è stato un cammino per eh, togliere questi due, questi due eh, problemi diciamo così, eh, alla spesa pensionistica italiana. Probabilmente in quegli anni Anni, io non le faccio assolutamente un fatto politico, le, le situazioni demografiche, le situazioni di sviluppo erano molto diverse, le condizioni politiche erano diverse, però è chiaro che nel giro di mezzo secolo le cose sono cambiate e quindi questi due tipi di, eh, di meccanismi non potevano essere più sostenibili e quindi si è cambiato il sistema di calcolo, si è passati dal sistema eh, retributivo a un sistema contributivo, si è eh, eliminato completamente quel discorso che riguarda l'uscita anticipata, le famose pensioni d'anzianità, oggi sono di fatto eliminate perché bisogna avere almeno 42 anni di contributi per andare in pensione, chiamiamola così, anticipata e l'età di accesso, cioè l'età di vecchiaia che allora era di 65 anni quota livello stabilito alla fine dell'Ottocento, ormai è salita da quest'anno a 66 anni e arriverà a 70 anni nel 2050. Dunque, insomma, tanti motivi per considerare questa riforma una riforma importante, ma probabilmente il processo che l'Italia ha fatto in materia pensionistica molto importante e che ha trovato coronamento con la riforma Monti-Fornero. La domanda quindi viene veramente spontanea, è la curiosità che tutti abbiamo eh, questa riforma è così ben fatta che gli altri debbano eh, copiarla? Ebbene, il professor Robert Holzman risponderà nella sua conferenza a questa domanda. Prego, professore. Grazie molto, signor Presidente. Sì, grazie. Grazie molto per questa introduzione, perché fa la mia vita molto più facile, o più facile. Because you may have asked her, given the title of, uh, of the presentation, uh, why should the world, why should other countries imitate the pension reform? What we have heard here, many reforms, recent reform, crisis, so what the heck are, is this? Is this a provocation? No, it's not a provocation. It's something which is in line with the conference, because it's dealing with uh, the life cycle concept. It's dealing with a pension concept which, uh, my understanding, has been widely uh, non-communicated in Italy. And what I would like to do is, hopefully, to provide you with a sense of, uh, yes, we really did something, as perhaps often we didn't do it fully the right way, but there's still room for improvement. But we did something which I will claim is which uh, other countries in the world is considering nowadays as a benchmark if it's done by the book. And just to let you know, it's not a provocation, the title, and also because I'm Austrian, uh, and on, in particular in this place here, uh, because I have very strong links to it. My uh, great-grandmother came from the region, so uh, another side, so it's not a provocation. So, But what is all this about? Pensions are, how to say, one of the key uh, instruments of thinking about the life cycle concept. And this is one of the topics of this conference there. And uh, how these transfers are done have a major bearing not only of individual welfare, but also on economic performance. So doing it well is extremely critical. And uh, Italy and Sweden have independently developed an approach which, how to say, have so far been adopted by a number of other countries, uh, which, uh, how to say, it's worthwhile to fully understand, and it's so interesting that other countries are looking at it very closely. So, against this background, why are other uh, workers in, how to say, in, in Italy not yet uh, jubilating, and why is it not yet an intellectual export good, but it should be? Well, it's a creative idea, how to say, which uh, in its design uh, could not get ahead to some extent as it should, and in its implementation, how to say, was also lacking. And the recent reform by 
my dear old friend uh, uh, Ferrero, she, 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 she somewhat moved in the direction as it should be. So, uh, why is it that it could not be implemented as it should be? Very simple, because the old system offered much better benefits at much lower retirement age, so there was a lot of political resistance to say, well, actually, uh, we prefer the old system, not the new system, which is clearly understandable. And the good thing is, and Italy is a good example for that, never let how to say, go by a crisis, use it productively, and so the reform by Monte Forero was an opportunity to make it happen. So, what are you going to hear? What is the structure? Hope it's not too much now. What's the structure? Number one is, I think to fully understand what this reform is about, we need to start from the very beginning, how life cycle saving and how pensions are, how to say, uh, part and parcel of uh, the application of the life cycle concept and how the reform, how to say, tries to move back to an optimization how individuals would like to do it. And this is what happens then in the second, uh, in the second uh, part there which uh, tries, so to say, to outline the promises of the scheme and what its promises if it's done by the book, which in Italy has not always happened, at least so far. The third thing is to talk a bit about the experience of these four forerunning countries, Italy and Sweden, followed by Latvia and uh, by Poland. And if we still have some time left, as I paint a pretty rose picture, a picture at times, it's a great concept, but not all the conceptual problems have been yet been solved. And with uh, the uh, part four, I would like to somewhat highlight to you some of the conceptual issues. So the one view of others doing his master's thesis or PhD thesis sees there's still room for, uh, for uh, uh, work there. So please uh, buckle up. I have, I think, uh, some 40 minutes and uh, many slides. So what is the first part about the uh, life cycle uh, planning, uh, public pensions, etc.? As you know, uh, the life cycle concept uh, tells us or proposes to think in the longer term. So our decisions are not only determined what happens currently, but how we want to uh, outline plan to over our lifetime. We heard yesterday it has to do with uh, education decision, it has to do to prepare for shocks, it has to do to plan for the period when we are older and we don't want to work so much anymore. So it's dealing with savings but also it's dealing with uh, how to say uh, the decision when to retire. A key result of the life cycle saving is to address it is to say well Individuals prefer a smooth consumption. They hate how to say, even if incomes are fluctuating a lot, their consumption they prefer to have smoother. So as a result of it, they don't want to have a lot when they are working and little when they're old. They'd like to have a little of uh, both of it. And in, within the life cycle context, what's happening is that if individuals behave rationally, I know that's a big assumption, but probably they do. And if the market provides the instruments to do, then individuals save to move money from now towards the future when they work less or nothing, and so they save for it. And uh, at this stage, if both assumptions are fulfilled, there's no need for any public pension. So let's move uh, to the simple graph, uh, which uh, those who study economics uh, uh, understand and uh, sorry for the uh, comp uh, for the simplicity there what we have there on the horizontal axis we have for uh, lifetime and we s look at the age of 15 think about it this was something what has happened in the past when people started to work at 15 they had a life expectancy to live up to the age of 75 and uh, for simplicity we assume that those individuals have a constant income than expect when they work uh, which is the red line up there. So then they have to make two decisions. The one is when to retire and how much uh, they want to consume in the future when they don't work anymore. 
let's assume that individuals decide to retire at the age of 60, and then uh, there's a simple calculation shows that there, uh, as we have uh, 45 years of work, 15 years of retirement, let's assume that the income is 100, then saving 25 uh, gives exactly, how to say, the uh, pre-retirement available income to consume and post-retirement income to consume, namely 75. And the whole thing is done with uh, savings. Uh, and if people have not inherited, which uh, most of us uh, don't, and if people don't want to leave too much inheritance, not at all, which some people do, uh, then I will say wealth goes up and down and speaks just at retirement, and then the saving takes place. Of course, we assume people know when they die, so we assume uh, to say this is the expectation value, not the reality. Now, why do we have we produced this one? Well, now let's two, uh, two very simple thought experiments. The first one we have already looked at is to say, People start at 15, uh, tie at 75, and we said they will uh, uh, retire at the age of 60, and so they have a contribution rate of 25%. Now, let us assume under the circumstances, people are told, actually, no, things have changed. Uh, you work longer, you, you uh, uh, start to work later at 20 because you have more education, and you also live longer to the age of 80. Okay. Well, given this, that people start later and die later, would those same individuals also retire at the age of 60 and have to face uh, a contribution rate of 30.3%, much higher? Or would the optimal reaction not be to say, well, since I start later, since I retire later, well, perhaps, sir, uh, 25, it's fine for me, so I don't want to pay more than 25, and my consumption of 75, this is what I need. But in this case, what would happen is people would voluntarily increase their retirement age from 60 to 65. So the message from the simple view is that, well, if individuals were left on their own, had the instrument there, could not rely on everybody else, if things change, they would also change their behavior. In this critical case, uh, they would increase uh, their retirement age and uh, live a happy, happy life before and after. So what happens if one introduces the a pension system? Well, the first thing is to understand why does the public sector get involved in this pension business? Well, very simply, because uh, to do the pension business out of your own, you have to have the instruments to carry money from now to the future, so the accumulation phase, and then uh, to do the disbursement phase. But as we don't know when we die, we have to buy an annuity, which gives us the consumption stream until we die. And frankly speaking, both require quite sophisticated financial markets to happen. Thanks for coming by, Senore. Thank you. Uh, so this is the reason why the government comes to the business because the instruments are not there, but they may also come to the business because, at least for a subset, they're too myopic in order to pick this up, so they need to be forced to contribute. Now, uh, what does then this mean with regards to the, uh, uh, to the pensions? How is this lack of uh, uh, markets and the provision by the government then doing something which puts us away from this optimality. But the first thing is to understand that the pension system which we now have for the blue and the white color employees, or the older systems, are still much influenced by what uh, we know how civil servants are treated. So when the first uh, public system were created, they looked at how were civil servants treated. Well, they received a pension which depended on the last income. In most cases, they didn't have to contribute or not have to say sufficient to cover for it. And this is how the systems were in many cases imitated. Uh, and if we use uh, uh, this one, the system in which the benefits and the contributions are little linked, well, this may have not very nice implications for when people uh, want to retire and want to behave.
So this is when we had to say, look at the, uh, uh, the conditions, the old, uh, the new conditions uh, of the system and about the choice there. Because let's assume, I would say, you live now in this new world in which you start to work at the age of 20 and you live to the age of 80. But uh, I would say, since you can externalize your decisions not retiring optimally, what is happening is that the contribution rate is little increased and also the benefit level is decreased. And you get your benefits when? When you want to take the benefits, what's optimal for you? Well, at the lowest possible retirement age, at the age of 60. You don't increase to the age of 65. Result? This is what we see all over in the OCT world and other world. The old defined benefit system invites people to behave rationally, but rationally means it's rationally for them, it's not rationally for society because people retire too early and the cost of later retirement is put on somebody else, not directly on them. And this is, how to say, the basic message of uh, this little thought experiment we went through. If you were to apply the life cycle concept in the original way, you wouldn't have to do all this kind of uh, controlling of individuals. People would do it by out of their own. What the reform wants to do is essentially to use the life cycle concept, but in a public system in order to make people to move the decisions which they would use out of their own and to bring the system logic to the table. And this is essentially what this new system, Italian system, uh, say has in mind. One of the things I know from reading Italian literature in English is that uh, the reform of uh, 94 uh, implemented 95 was done with a huge speed, was done marvelously and very quickly. But what has happened is that the reform was not at all communicated. It was not communicated to the public, was not communicated to politicians, and was not communicated to the very important function of uh, journalists. So as a result of it, when later on, how to say, politicians came in with uh, proposals which were not in line with the original system ideas, there was no defense there. And this is the reason why the reform was not implemented as it should be. Because what we know from the political economy of reforms is you have to bring the public along, you have to educate the journalist, and then, how to say, you're able to live up to the promises of a reform. So what is this... Uh, uh, what is this, this reform all about? What is the uh, new system uh, thriving on? First of all, it really tries to mimic the financial market system. So during the accumulation phase and during the decumulation phase, it is, how to say, substituting for the market there. The second thing is, if it is well done, according to the rules of the book, it promises financial solvency, not immediately, but out in the future that the system will be able to handle aging, to handle other shocks out of their own, so need for the government to come in and to subsidize it. And everything, how to say, happening under the system that remains essentially unfunded. Because everything else I've said could have been happened from uh, uh, through a financial market system, to some extent, if a system works. But the system tries to remain unfunded, so uh, to uh, avoid the transition costs uh, which normally emerge if you move from an unfunded to a funded system. Now, how is the system making this happen? That on the one hand it mimics a, 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 a system, uh, on the other hand, how to say it is able to do the financial solvency and make it happen. Well, the system in uh, English, it's called non-financial and notional defined contribution system because uh, it uh, uh, works in such a way that it uh, asks participants themselves or the employer to pay contributions into an account and the contribution rate is fixed. 
On this account, the contributions are recorded, but every year the account receives also an interest rate, uh, which is added to the account there. And at the age of retirement, individuals have a pot of money, which is notionally there, and this amount of money plus the remaining life expectancy determines how much pension you get. A full replication of the life cycle concept going up and going down in notional terms. So it's an extremely fair system because what you pay in, you get out. What you get out, you get paid in in, uh, in, in actual values, not more, not less. This is, how to say, the microeconomic logic for you individually. How does the system, uh, how is the system able to create the macroeconomic solvency, which is, how to say, the key question for pension systems across the world? Well, very simple. What the system says is, well, every system, also an unfunded base your go system, delivers an internal rate of return. What's the internal rate of return? It's the rate which brings a stream of payments into the system at, at equal value with the stream of payments out of the system. So for each system in which you pay something in, you get something out, you can, without too much complication, calculate what is the internal rate of return. And the NDC system turns this on its head and said, we have a system in which we pay only the individuals the internal rate of return, not less, not more, and this is the way how the system remains financially solvent. Or put it more complex, if you have a pension system, you have to apply assets and liabilities, and what you do is you index your liabilities only with the increase in the value of your assets, and also an unfunded system has assets which can be used to that. To make it, how to say, very transparent and graphic in this, this is a, a, a graph which uh, came out from uh, work we did uh, uh, for Jordan, which has a still a young system with a young population. So uh, by the year 2007 or 8, when the calculations were done, I had to say this is where the, uh, some uh, projections were done. The red line is if the system were to continue as it is. Uh, and what you have down there is the internal rate of return coming out of the system. And if this rate of return uh, were to continue, I to say you would see that the deficit will soon approach 10% uh, of GDP. If we index the liabilities only with a rate of return of 5%, well, it's only, how to say, slowing down. If we have an uh, internal rate of return of uh, contributions of 3%, it's becoming negative before it shows an upward trend again. And if we have a rate of return of uh, uh, putting it of 1%, how to say, it remains always positive. So this gives the intuition you only have to pitch the right rate of return and then keep your system solvent. So a very simple system, you pay in, you get an interest rate of return, you get an annuity which is based on your remaining life expectancy. So you determine how much you get. If you go too early, you receive less. If you leave later, you receive more. And you have a rate of return which is calculated in such a way that guarantees solvency or financial stability the way how the system is set up. Perfect, simple. My understanding is in this uh, simplicity, the system was not as communicated. So uh, then uh, before entering some of the more technical issues there, let's move to the third part of my talk. Let's move, how to say, the uh, application and experience of the model in member countries. And here, how to say, we start out with a broader view, how to say, to give you some enticement and to understand, the, how to say, the title of my talk uh, uh, is not a provocation. 
The system was introduced more or less according to the concept, not fully according to the concept, in these four countries up there. We deal with it on the next slides onward. But it also has, in the meantime, found a little more dynamic than this one. Norway introduced an NDC-type system in 2009. It has been in operation since, uh, 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 since uh, last year. And Egypt uh, decided by law uh, the system in June 2010. Then we had the revolution, so the country is, is currently trying to grapple with the introduction. So I think we have to wait until the new government comes to the table. And um, I'm happy to say that in Egypt, I, was, sir, I was instrumental in selling it to the then Minister of Finance. Then, I to say, we have for other countries which are taken out, uh, no, there's some out there, the underneath there, uh, countries that have reforms inspired by NDC, starting from Azerbaijan and ending up with Russia, the few countries in between. Inspired means they took some elements there, but not everything. Yeah which, a bit like in Italy, I had to say, was a mistake, because it's better, I had to say, if you do it, you do it well, and don't try, I had to say, to, uh, to play around. And then you have countries which have a system which is close, but not fully to the NDC system, but already older. It's the German point system, the French point system. And this has inspired a number of uh, Central Eastern European countries to do it there. So it's not fully a point system, but almost there. And then you have a number of countries where you have a strong discussion of introducing NDC or not NDC. And you have the list of countries there. And this includes also China. And uh, we'll see what the outcome is, sir. We will uh, publish this uh, year a report on China. The Chinese government permitted its publication. Uh, it's essentially a review, uh, a vision piece for Chinese pension reform that I led. And it has, of course, surprise, surprise, the NDC system as a key core of the future pension system. So, and if you go and read OECD publications about the reform of their unfunded public system, essentially the word is out that all the reforms are essentially trying to mimic uh, characteristics of an NDC system by making the period over which uh, the pension base is calculated to the lifetime, by applying actuarial increments and decrements, by doing this and that, by introducing demographic uh, factors there. So what you have there, you have essentially the NDC system, even if uh, countries don't apply it, it becomes a benchmark. So the reason is other countries can learn from uh, the uh, Italian innovated, in invented and innovated reform. So let us move now. Uh, to uh, the overall lessons before we go through some of the system description to give you a comparative view how Italy is doing. Overall, the reform went fine and uh, the projected replacement rate and the financial stability calculation show that the system will remain financially stable over the long run and this also the recent calculation has shown this is the case uh, also for Italy. It has also shown that in order to do it well, you need to have a lot of technically preparatory work, but also you need to have good communications, and you need to prepare how to set implementation well. If you don't do it, you get hiccups, and it happened in some countries before it got reformed. Uh, all four countries use somewhat different, slightly different approaches. All came out with roughly but not fully equivalent uh, results, which is always good because this uh, variance allows you to learn. And we will come back to that, how to say what one can learn from the Italian uh, reform. And uh, the past reforms were undertaken against the background of the crisis of the 1990s. And uh, those countries that didn't go for the full way, like Italy, they had the opportunity through the Monte for Nero reform to somewhat adjust it uh, to 20 years too late, but better done once than never. So let me walk you very quickly to some, not all of the tables there, just to get the message across what should be done. This is the question, 
if and as you move to a new system, the question is, does it apply the new system now to everybody, uh, only to a subset of the working population? And what it shows, the difference between the countries here is that there are two countries, Latvia and Sweden, said our system and the C system applies to everybody. Blue color worker, uh, white color worker, civil servants, self employed, everybody is subject to the same system. Poland, there, the government had to make some compromises. Essentially, the civil servants slipped out. And in 2005, also the miners were allowed to slip out. And Italy, astonishingly, this was done pretty well, although with the exception of a few subgroups. Essentially, everybody is covered, and below you have the uh, exceptions which are down there. More difficult, how to say, in Italy was the next, the, press the button, oh, it's here. Uh, the next decision here is uh, the uh, contribution rate. As you can see, Latvia, Poland, and Sweden have a total contribution rate which ranges between 18.5 and 20 percent, of which only a, the major part, but not everything, is used for NDC. The others is used for FDC pensions there. In Italy, you have for uh, white and blue color workers, a very high contribution rate, 33 percent is pretty high. You have a lower one for self-employed, and then you have, I would say, for atypical contracts, 24 percent. And originally what has happened is you have to say, okay, you get your uh, 24 percent or so, but this is what you pay. Actually, uh, what you uh, credit you on your account is actually more. This is not fully in line with the spirit of a defined contribution system. So it took some time before, before this could get uh, uh, reformed. And uh, then you have also occupational pensions, which in Italy is growing quickly as part of the severance pay reform which is coming out there. But the critical part where I had to say most of the, how to say, uh, 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 how to say, problems of the system arose in the meantime, which got somewhat corrected with the recent reform is, when do you oblige individuals contributing to the new system? I don't know who of you stopped smoking. Uh, you know, there's the, there's the fact that you do it slowly with batches and you, they, you try to slow it down. At the end of the day, it doesn't work. You go back, etc. And uh, what some people maintain is the best way of doing it is, is the cold turkey approach. One day to the next, you change it. Well, how to say this has the beauty of uh, you really put everybody on the new system. Well, isn't this uh, somewhat disadvantaging those who have been under the old system? Not really. Because under an NEC system, what you can do is uh, you can say, OK, so far you have been a system which provided you benefits at a lower retirement age. This has the value of X. And this is value we give you on your notional account as notional money. But the next day, you pay as everybody else this kind of contributions. You get this amount of benefits there. And this is what, how to say, Latvia has done fully. They as of 96, called Turkey from one day to the next, they had the new system. Sweden was close by, Italy somewhat behind, but in Italy, here, how to say, only people, how to, uh, the, essentially only the people who joined the labor market as of now were obliged to be under the new system. For everybody else, you had some kind of transition rules. And this is, how to say, created the big mass. Number one is because the unsustainability of the system was prolonged. The second part is all these nice life cycle reactions, how they should happen, didn't happen because people still had the old system. With the reform of uh, November 2011 now, this had tried to get cut. Some people who didn't have NDC accounts have them now. Some, but not all, of the seniority uh, uh, pensions were uh, cut, and the retirement age, how to say, was reduced. And now it's the only country which has the retirement age indexed with life expectancy. So this is 
what should have happened but didn't happen. And uh, unfortunately, at those this was not communicated enough for that this uh, is something which has a lot of value, and if one looks into the recent calculations, creates, how to say, this decrease in expenditures over 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 uh, the uh, next decades uh, before it goes back again to the debulge of the uh, baby boom generation. Uh, and next thing which often happens is saying, well, you know, this is a system which has no solidarity. Because, you know, it's an individual account system, so it is uh, uh, void of any kind of our social heart beating uh, because uh, no redistribution. That's wrong. It's a system which is very fair because it uh, detects if uh, some group is uh, advantaged. And in most cases, it's not the poor that are advantaged, but other groups. But it allows very transparent ways in which. Uh, uh, how to say, uh, uh, redistribution happens. And this is the lower part of it across the countries. A lot of redistribution is happening. For example, you get uh, years uh, for when the woman stays at home. Uh, you, you get years uh, uh, of uh, replacement when you are, uh, when you are uh, unemployed, etc. But what has to happen in such a system, like in any disease system, the government has to carve up the money. They cannot make a promise and say, we promise now, we pay later. No, no, no. You can promise something, but you have to carve up the money. This is also a very important uh, 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 part of it. And then we have something uh, which I don't say would go too much into the details, but just uh, uh, to uh, 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 give you some feeling there, we just focus on the first uh, two uh, rows there. It is, uh, if and as sir, uh, the pensions are calculated out of the notionally accumulated amount, uh, what has happened in principle in all cases is uh, that uh, you uh, divide it by the life expectancy at your retirement age. Uh, and what happens in, uh, in most cases nowadays that the post-retirement pensions are price indexed, in some countries with a little bit of real wage indexation, but essentially price indexation. And then the lower part of it is all these countries have a social pensions to make uh, things uh, happen. So uh, did the system so far live up to the promises? Well, it does, sir. At least there uh, to say in some of the ex ante uh, simulations, what you have here is these are the calculated, not actual yet, uh, increases in the labor force participation for different age ranges. And what one assumes there is, uh, to say in Italy, that the labor force participation of those 55 to 64 is going to increase by almost 15 percentage point, which is quite a lot, uh, and uh, assumed to go further on. The highest increase is assumed for. Uh, for uh, uh, for uh, Boland. Uh, the next one is calculations of uh, the links between individual earnings presented as a multiple of average earnings and the pensions there. And as it is, how to say, what you pay in, you get out. Differences are, how to say, on your contribution rate. You have this linear uh, curvature in the main part at the lower end and the higher end here how to say minimum and maxima play a role. And last but not least, I think this is an important part of it. These are projections from the 2009 uh, uh, European Union uh, projections. So the latest figures uh, I had not when I prepared that they have been published in the meantime. And uh, no, moving over here, nobody. This is the change in uh, expenditures in percent of GDP for the reform countries. And this is the change in expenditures in percent of GDP over the period 2007-2060 for all the 27 countries. And for, and, oh, it's here, thank you. Sorry, it's here there. Can go back. So this the green one is uh, the change in expenditures percent of GDP for reform countries, and all of them envisage 
a major decrease of public expenditures. And these are the changes for all the 27 uh, uh, reform countries. What you see there, those countries that have done an NDC reform are expected to have afforded expenditures, or the others, uh, to say, since they include the others even more, expect an increase. So financial sustainability is not only a promise. If one sticks to the rule, it's something which happens out there. Uh, This is something which would require half an hour to explain, so I'll give you only the, the big uh, uh, message there. The system works if you choose the internal rate of return, the notional interest rate right. And uh, others say how to choose it, we'll come back to this, uh, is uh, others is still something which is uh, surrounded by uncertainty because we know how we have to choose it in the steady state. But in the real world, we have to use proxies. And what these countries are using as kind of a proxy there is uh, in Sweden, you use the per capita wages. In Italy, the GDP growth rate. And in Poland and Latvia, you use the contribution base. These are reasonable proxies. and they're in steady state, uh, uh, the first three would be equivalent, but it's a proxy. What happens if a proxy doesn't realize the number of years? You have to come in with how to say, balancing mechanisms. And there are only one country, which is Sweden, has a balancing mechanism, but even this one, how does it get somewhat rocked uh, during the crisis? It survived, but it got rocked. And this table explains how this balancing mechanism has happened. In all countries, there's something there, but in all countries, there's room for improvement, and we will go back to this one. So this leads then, let us say, to the uh, kind of, uh, of uh, messages out of it from what one can learn across the countries what to do. And the first lesson which is there, it's particularly coming out from the Italian reform is, if you do a transition from the old DP system to the new NDC system, use the cold turkey approach. Don't wait too long. And to make the point, this is uh, something uh, uh, Tito Perry, when he saw my slides, has been enough, nice enough to grant me permission to use it. That's the reason why it's done here. This is essentially how to say uh, the transition in uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Sweden, a transition in, in Italy, uh, which means, how to say, in, uh, in uh, Sweden, even, how to say, those who just entered the labor market were in the new system. It took some time, how to say, only those after the age, we at the time of 43, where, how to say, uh, were uh, state under the 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 the, uh, uh, the, the old system, that's the Italian part of it. Whereas in 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 uh, Sweden, what you have there, how to say, up to the age of 45, everybody was immediately in the new system, and only 85 and others had this kind of sliding in. And if you were to take, how uh, to say, uh, the uh, Latvian reform, this purple color would not exist because everybody was immediately into the new system. So go the cold turkey approach has been a major lesson there. Uh, the other part was, uh, as you move towards a new system, you have costs coming from the old one, which cannot be yet financed through, the, in most cases, lower new contribution rate. So you have legacy costs. And none of the countries, I would say, really identified the legacy costs. Sweden didn't need to because they had the reserve fund, which was importantly there. Uh, others are trying at those little cheating. They give uh, the current uh, uh, retirees and future early uh, retirees uh, less than they should get in order to finance the transition costs uh, uh, to the new system, which uh, somewhat weakens the link between contribution and benefits. Uh, the, first, the third part is that one should adopt a stabilizing mechanism because it allows you to react early 
and not to wait until a system becomes again, how to say, non-financeable if and as things uh, go wrong. Establish a reserve fund, and the last part is develop uh, uh, a mechanism to deal with sharing the longevity risk. Well, these are also the areas there which are part number four, but which I won't use. So on the next slides, also in the Italian version, it tries technically to motivate why it's important to think about it, why it's think about it uh, in the sense of uh, how to think about the notional interest rate, uh, how to design the balancing mechanisms, how to address the, uh, the, the uh, cost of the firm, how to think about the reserve fund, and how to estimate the life expectancy there. Would be fun to talk each of them, would be require an own presentation, I won't do it. For this reason, let me move forward quickly, then I stay within uh, uh, my allocated time of three quarters of an hour. And uh, 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 for you uh, uh, to get the key messages out there. I think uh, I'm biased on this reform approach, but I truly believe it is uh, a very promising uh, approach to uh, achieve a sustainable, fair, and non distortionary basic ecosystem. I think it's really something, I have to say, in the Italian economist who dreamed it up congratulated because it really tries to bring the logic of a pension system back to what it is. And this is critical, and for this, I have to say, great applause. If they had uh, had uh, more understanding about the political economy, they should have uh, communicated it better, and I would say uh, they should have uh, talked to journalists early on in order to win them over and tell them how to say, listen, if the politicians say this one, you go after them. And this is what we try to do at the World Bank to educate journalists, how to say, to be our partners uh, during the reform. But of course, I would say, no system is what I call politically foolproof. So each system can, I would say, be badly used. But uh, the more you structure it according to the books, the less politicians have a chance to cheat. And so thinking about the book is important. And the good news, I would say, for you as uh, future retirees, but for the others, for those who are still doing their master PhD studies. I think the system offers a lot, but not everything has been solved analytically, conceptually, empirically. So there's a lot of room still for you uh, to, to think about. Uh, I want to move on now. It's one of the reasons why I accepted the invitation to this talk is, and uh, also Dieter Perry invited me here, was there is a book out, actually, a publication in two volumes. Uh, and it's in print as we speak. Volume one goes to the printer today. Fortunately, I had to say a week, uh, a month uh, too late. So the first one is dealing with, uh, how to say, the issues of, I uh, can't read it from here, but it's the progress, the lessons, and the implementation. And the second one is dealing with gender, political economy, and financial sustainability. And altogether, 58 people have uh, contributed to it. So if you want to learn something about how to do it by the book and about the open issue, you can get it soon uh, 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 on the web as a free ebook. And uh, um, if you have my email address, uh, if you write me, I, don't say, I will put you on the list and you even get the a free, uh, a free uh, printed copy uh, uh, from me, since uh, uh, this is a kind of compensation having gone through this. And uh, grazie per la vostra attenzione. Looking forward to the discussion. Grazie, Professor Olsma. Devo dire, va ringraziato, Professore, per la chiarezza esemplare e anche per aver, come dire, fatto dei complimenti all'Italia, cioè uno dei pochi che è in una delle poche materie dove a questo punto possiamo vantare un sistema che funziona e che viene copiato. Io credo che 
c'è spazio per, per, delle, per delle domande. Naturalmente è chiaro che il problema è la, la questione, l'argomento è molto tecnico, però ho visto che tutti noi abbiamo insomma, seguito con grande attenzione e quindi probabilmente siamo, siamo, siamo interessati e quindi saremo interessati anche a, delle, a dei chiarimenti o a delle spiegazioni che potrà fornirci ulteriormente il professor Holzman. Io intanto, anche per farlo riposare prima di cominciare a raccogliere le domande, mi pare di aver capito che, e in effetti ha ragione quando dice che, eh, che la riforma Dini, insomma quella che introduce il contributivo e probabilmente anche quest'ultima ha avuto un difetto di comunicazione perché la, 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 la formula con cui il professore l'ha spiegata, cioè che è quella della eh, garanzia individuale nel momento dell'ingresso e solidarietà nel momento dell'uscita ecco io credo che questo eh, generale a, a, nel momento dell'uscita questo dà, dà, dà molto la chiave di lettura di quello di, della, della, della portata politica che non è eh, l'eccesso del sistema retributivo che basava la pensione sull'ultimo stipendio insomma, in modo ingiusto nei confronti degli altri e non è il sistema a capitalizzazione io giornalisticamente lo chiamerei cileno, insomma, dove la solidarietà, dove la solidarietà non c'è. Quindi in effetti questa chiave di lettura è mancata, forse direi per difendere la categoria è mancata ai politici che non hanno saputo, forse probabilmente non hanno avuto la capacità di sintesi di, e di, eh, oppure non hanno parlato con il professor Olzma che gliel'avrebbe spiegata in modo più, più, più efficace. Ehm... A questo, a questo punto io direi che eh, abbiamo anche la possibilità di far circolare un microfono in sala e se ci sono domande, osservazioni anche molto, voglio dire, di carattere più tecnico, se qualcuno è interessato, oppure di carattere anche personale, insomma. Ad esempio io mi chiederei a un certo punto... Eh, Qual è il prezzo in termini, e questo poi magari il professore potrà rispondere dopo, eh, qual è il prezzo in termini di, eh, di assegno che io pagherò con, con il nuovo sistema, che quelle, le generazioni che andranno in pensione quando il sistema sarà a regime, eh, insomma, che sconto sulla pensione dovranno fare al nostro sistema pensionistico? Quanto, quanto, a quanto ammonterà il taglio? Si dice, io leggo dalle stime, insomma, che... Già le generazioni tra i 40 e i 50 anni che oggi hanno tra i 40 e i 50 anni eh, subiranno un taglio del 50%, però insomma se questo, eh, cioè subiranno un taglio del 50%, eh, avranno il 50% del, del, de, del, dello stipendio che avevano in, in, in precedenza, mentre con i vecchi sistemi, con il sistema retributivo si arrivava all'80%, eccetera. Però se questo è il, il prezzo che dobbiamo pagare alla stabilità, alla, alla solidità del sistema, e, al, eh, come dire, e alle pensioni dei nostri figli o dei nostri nipoti probabilmente questo è un prezzo che possiamo pagare prego eh, ecco io in italiano? vi consiglierei di, di dire nome e cognome magari anche il, quello che fate nella vita può essere interessante anche per il professore poter rispondere così ok io sono Paolo Roberti e sono qui come ha detto stampa credo e... ok we'll do a question in English I guess Okay. Se vuole va benissimo. Ok, so uh, in Italy, it's, uh, Italy is a country that is famous for a, a kind of thing that is called like uh, family welfare, no? So well, there, is a, there is a kind of redistribution inside like uh, generations and families. You don't think that it's dangerous to uh, this kind of pension reform because like, for example, my parents, they went to, they retired at 56 and 60 and now they're taking care of the, my nephews. Because in Italy there is no such thing like uh, help for young families, so my my sister and my brother don't have any chance to have like uh, help from the from the state for their for them for their kids. So you don't think that this will create like a kind of um, I don't know bad externality for like uh, this kind of family welfare. So now the people that that have to retire later, they they cannot take care of their nephews. They cannot do the other things that they were doing before. And the second question is, uh, you don't think that like, the, pens the pension system should be used also as an income redistribution? Okay. Grazie. Professore, se vuole rispondere già da adesso, oppure vogliamo fare altre domande? Altre domande? Bene. Sì, prego. 
Dunque, sono Franco Fietta, eh, sono nel consiglio di amministrazione di uno degli enti pensionistici, che, dei professionisti che, dovranno affrontare, che stanno affrontando in questo momento la riforma per passare al sistema contributivo. Eh, due domande in particolare, uno eh, riguarda il periodo di transizione che eh, come abbiamo visto, noi abbiamo preso come modello il sistema svedese, quantomeno per avere delle indicazioni ulteriori rispetto al sistema italiano. La, una grande differenza che abbiamo notato è quella relativa appunto al periodo di transizione. Eh, quella italiana abbiamo visto è molto lunga, quella svedese eh, interviene anche su quella che in Italia viene definita un, il diritto acquisito. Eh, di fatto in Italia è previsto il sistema prorata con eh, l'attivazione dal momento di riforma, io sto parlando per il nostro nuovo sistema come imposto dal dall'ultima dall legge, eh, da, dal momento della riforma tutti pagheranno il nuovo contributo e da quel momento quella quota di pensione sarà contributiva mentre la precedente sarà comunque retributiva. Ecco un suo commento su questo sistema di transizione se lo ritiene sufficientemente equo da una parte e anche equilibrato dal punto di vista economico tenendo comunque conto che noi abbiamo comunque una riserva eh, di, di patrimonio che copre circa indicativamente un quarto di quella che è la riserva matematica. Una seconda domanda riguardo quello che è eh, il concetto del... Scusi un attimo. Sì, intanto le faccio io. Qual è l'ente? Forse mi è sfuggito. In Arcassa, ah. eh, ingegneri e architetti. Eh, per quanto invece riguarda quello che è eh, gli aspetti di... Eh, di equità e quantomeno di, ehm, di aiuto ai redditi più bassi. Il sistema retributivo, quantomeno il nostro, garantiva attraverso coefficienti di trasformazione progressivi, che si riducevano progressivamente all'aumentare del reddito, eh, migliori ritorni pensionistici per i, per le, mh, per i redditi più bassi. Un sistema contributivo non, non consente questo sistema, quantomeno suppongo non lo possa consentire. Anche su questo come co, un suo commento rispetto al concetto di equità. Grazie. Grazie. Altre domande? Oh, andiamo con la risposta? Prego professore. C'è un'altra domanda? Eh, magari facciamo rispondere il professore che poi così continuiamo. Thanks, since I have three questions, it makes okay. things easier. Uh, thanks for the good question. Um, I think uh, the second and the third one has to do with the question of uh, redistribution. Uh, is the current system, how to say, uh, a court system because it doesn't allow uh, to redistribute to where the government thinks uh, the money should be redistributed, came out from your question, comes out from your question, part number two. Well, the NDC system, the notional defined contribution systems, allows this, but what it does, if you do it, it requires the highest transparency which exists, which is not the case in the typical defined benefit system. Because uh, in your question is, uh, uh, came up there, uh, the system doesn't allow income redistribution. It allows it, but what we know from studies is, and I'm sure there are a few researchers here, and if Elsa von Ehre would be here, she would uh, be able to add to this out of her own research. In a typical defined benefit system, compared what the rhetoric has, you don't have a distribution typically from the rich to the poor, you have it typically from the poor to the rich. So it's not, I to say, that the poor are profiting from it, the poor are paying for it. I could go into details there. The typical uh, example is poor people or poor workers, they have a flat income profile uh, which falls towards the end, whereas the richer people have a steep income profile. And if you have a defined benefit system which uses only the last few years, those who started early out and have an income profit which falls, which is not rising, they are disadvantaged, the others are advantaged. 
So in most, almost all countries where you have a DP system, the old system was redistributive, but towards the rich, not towards the poor. If I want to do redistribution and the last question towards the poor, you can easily do it. And this is done in a number of countries, I don't say, uh, in the way that if you say, well, somebody who does, whose contribution does not uh, exceed such and such, he may get, I would have said, from one lira, he gets another lira from the government, so for the low income based. And this is happening, so you have the possibility to redistribute uh, towards uh, the lower income groups in an easy but fully transparent manner. Everybody knows what's, uh, what's, what's happening. And the same thing I would say with regards to the issue of the transition there was your first question, and the person from, the, uh, from this uh, uh, pension, uh, uh, pension system. People like to compare themselves with others. And there's never a possibility how today to do it in a way in which everybody is to the last cent made at this equal level. If you have a transition period of 20, 30, 40 years, you have to say, are dealing with people which are perhaps only one year apart in a way which is not to the cent comparable. And this creates then the political headache in which, I do say, uh, parliamentarians are called, you know, I receive five euros less than the other person. This is the reason why, how to say, the cold Turkey approach is the one which allows to guarantee acquired rights. And I fully understand that acquired rights should be as much as possible, or if possible, fully respected. But the next day, you start out with the same system. And this is what the NDC system allows. It allows also harmonization of different systems. Because one of the reasons why in Italy, as in Greece, the uh, pension system always created a problem was that there, you had a multitude of different systems there. And as long as the systems that were so fragmented, each time you want to do something, they said, well, I would do it, but first the others have to do it, so it's difficult to start out. This way, in order that you guarantee what you have acquired so far in the DP system is given you as a lump sum payment on your notional account, but the next day you continue with the same system as everybody else. This is a way which is fair. This is a system which allows that people, nobody is put at disadvantage, but this is a system, how to say, which brings in the microeconomic incentive system of the scheme the very next day, and not in 40 years only, when, as we've seen, it may be uh, uh, too late. And then to the interesting questions of this, uh, of the uh, uh, journalist from La Stamper. Uh, well, if you ask people to work too long, uh, they're not able to take care of the nephews of their grandchildren. It's an interesting argument because uh, my spouse sitting over there and I we also take care of our grandchildren off and on, not continuously there. So it's an important part, uh, to say, uh, of, of family linkages there. And there, uh, my argument is, first of all, yes, it's an important consideration. But if you think it's important, then as an economist, what you should do is to say, OK, if I do this, how much does it cost? If we do this, how much does it cost to achieve the same thing? And what is more effective and what is more efficient? And giving everybody this possibility, but only 10% or 20% are doing it, is perhaps not the best way of doing it. So in this case, introducing a system which allows parents to do their job, but have, as in France or in other uh, countries, the possibility to have market-based systems or government-financed system to allow taking care of their, of their kids in school is quite likely the much cheaper, uh, the ch much uh, cheaper uh, system. And uh, uh, then I wrote down your question, but now you have to recall it. It is the uh, internal rate of return. What was it? Sorry, remind me. 
was your question what you gave? I, I wrote it down, but I can't remember. Probably the times of transition, I think. But the transition, I think I had already answered. You can keep the acquired rights in the transitions in a, a, a DP system towards a DC system fully out there. There's no, there's no, no uh, contrast to that. You're fully able to respect the acquired rights. Quindi, quindi lei, lei suggerirebbe, uh, suggerirebbe un'ulteriore correzione al sistema italiano da questo punto di vista? Well, I'll just say the most recent reform moved a bit further, but not as far as it had happened. So because what has happened is that only those who, how to say, are, uh, who had not received an NDC account are now uh, uh, transferred to an NDC account. So it's happening. And uh, what also has happened is that there some, but not all, of the uh, seniority pensions have been tightened or abolished. So it's happening. But if it would be feasible, I think it would be still useful to calculate the, the present value of the parallel pensions, transform them into an amount, and uh, uh, accredit it to the NDC system. I think it could still be done, and then you would really have, how to say, the full power of the NDC system. So uh, uh, the wish, it's too, it's, it's, too, it's too early for Christmas, but I would say wish to Santa Claus would be to do it, because this would make, this immediate change would make a huge difference for the labor market incentives there. But I think, yes, no, one, 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 I would say one thing, uh, uh, which is all behind uh, the questions there is the NDC system, and that's the reason I started out with thinking about the life cycle system, is based on an assumption which I think most economists would say it's correct. If your life expectancy increases, life expectancy as an adult, what is your optimal reaction to this? Is it that you would like to pay a higher contribution rate, which would be a feasible outcome under a life cycle optimization? So if you live longer, you still want to say, I don't want to retire too late, I want to retire at 60. The question is if individuals would be willing to pay the higher contribution rate. And the empirical support what we get is that people don't want to pay too high contribution rate in order to live too long. But the critical part also is kicking people out of the job, having them leave at the age of 60. They find out at the age of 62, 63, 64, it's not so much fun uh, to, how to say, to sit uh, uh, in front of the TV. Uh, or, uh, to say, to not be engaged. Because uh, it would be different talk. Uh, I only mention one thing. What, make ins what makes aging happy? What is it what makes people age happy and healthy? And the number one thing is having a purpose, which is a job, which is a hobby. If you don't have it, if you kick people out too early, they die earlier. And there's increasing empirical evidence that uh, uh, people who retire early, voluntarily retire early, not because they're sick, so you control over it, they die early as well. So re early retirement is linked with higher mortality for those who retire early, controlling all the other things. So I think I would say there's all this political part, I want to have my early retirement. The reason is, and here the second part of the policy comes to the table. Uh, during the conference, a number of uh, issues have been raised, but this is something where, well, it's a challenge to the employers and the trade unions. This is to make sure the jobs are there for the elderly, to make sure how to say the elderly have a job. My sense is if, uh, if in countries that increase the retirement age, there would be really new ways in order to keep the older on the labor market with a new approach, you wouldn't get this political resistance. 
So only increasing the retirement age by law doesn't do the trick. You have to have a program which is dealing with the labor market implications of later retirement. And this is not rocket science, but not all this thing has been done. And this needs to be part and parcel of the overall reform uh, developments in Europe, but also in the rest of the world. Grazie, professore. Ecco, altre domande, prego. Calista, io volevo dirle che non sono assolutamente d'accordo con lei quando afferma che lo Stato interviene a sostegno eh, dei giovani che sono costretti a lavorare fornendo dei servizi sociali. Sappiamo tutti che in una fase di recessione succede esattamente il contrario, perché quello che si sta verificando è un taglio del welfare. Oltretutto eh, il fatto di poter andare in pensione a un'età in cui ancora le persone sono attive consente di fornire l'assistenza alle persone anziane, vecchie, che sappiamo anche in questo caso si sta tagliando su quella parte perché l'assistenza fornita dallo Stato sulle persone anziane è sempre meno. Al di là di queste considerazioni, secondo me in questa manovra c'è un altro elemento di iniquità e è dovuto ai differenti tassi di contribuzione che le varie categorie di lavoratori hanno, fanno durante la vita lavorativa. In effetti il tasso di contribuzione del lavoratore dipendente ormai è attestato sul 33%. Altre categorie sono notevolmente, ma notevolmente a tassi inferiori. Questo ehm, dà due motivi di eh, spunto. Uno è quello che chi versa meno contributi, effettivamente col sistema che diceva il professore, avrà anche una pensione proporzionata. Però è altrettanto vero che durante la vita lavorativa, se io verso meno contributi, quella parte di risorse che non verso le posso investire in... Eh, altri sistemi che potrebbero essere maggiormente produttivi eh, a livello di, eh, eh, di risparmi per un'eventuale pensione. Lei che ne pensa? Eh, prego professore, mi sembra una domanda diretta, può, può rispondere, poi vediamo se ci sono altre, altre domande. Let's start from uh, bottom up. Uh, Fully agreed, I don't say, if you pay a lower contribution for the public system, this opens room for uh, your private savings for, for, the older, for the older age. And this has been the idea in some countries in which, uh, like in, 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 in uh, Poland and in Latvia, where the contribution rate, I don't say, was reduced. And on this reduced contribution rate, you made room for a funded system. Uh, but what it means there is, since you have to continue to pay for the pension as they are, you have a transition deficit, and unless you plan for it wisely, you run into problems. So if you are suddenly hit by a crisis, as the current crisis, the budget of this country started to squeeze. So a great idea, but it has some fiscal implications for which the money needs to be there. But what definitely is happening is that there individuals, are particularly how to say they, those self-employed, they don't want to pay 33%. They prefer to have something much less, paying less and receiving less. Because 33% paying out of your own pocket. So if you, because normally what's happening, employees don't see the full amount, they see only their contribution. They don't see the contribution from the employer. In addition, they believe the contribution from the employer is financed by the employer. It's paid by the employer, but the burden is paid by the individual. Uh, all the econometric evidence uh, shows in this direction. And happy to share it with you. There's not a single country in which I would say the contribution by the employer is not fully or to a large part paid by the employee. It's not by the employer. This is something, how to say, which unfortunately some people never understood, but it's wrong because it leads to the wrong policy. So if you have to pay it out of your own money, for this reason I always think uh, contribution should be paid by the individual, not by the employer, because in this case they would see how much it is and not have the illusion and demand something which is not out there. Uh, coming back to the issue of uh, uh, 
you say early retirement allows you not only taking care of the children, so the next generation, but taking care of the prior generation. Sounds like a good argument, but uh, I have to say the calculations I know, not from Italy, shows that this is a very still expensive way in order of dealing with the problem. So if you do the calculations properly, you find out it is a way of dealing with it. You have somebody taking care of uh, the older persons, but it's not the most efficient way of dealing with it. And uh, so if you want to deal with it in an expensive way, there must be other strong arguments to make it happen. And uh, I would be happy if you show me calculations that uh, sending people to retirement early is a cheaper way than having professional services for the elderly and having professional service for the children. It may be, but before I believe something, I want to see the calculations. You know, I, I'm, I'm a person who believes very much in empirical evidence. I don't believe in parole, I believe in evidence. Altre domande? Prego. My question is certainly very naive, but I, I think it also has to do with the problem of communication that you underlined. Uh, I know a lot of people that hate this government because they, they will retire later. And on one hand, I, I know the reasons be, behind the, and, and you underline them very well. On the other hand, I would tend to say as, let's say, an economist, an economist student, why shouldn't they be free to retire when they want and get what they give? Now, uh, I, I can understand there are scale reasons, but I'd like to give a clear answer to, <laughs> to this kind of thing. Too. No, I think you already gave the answer. Uh, if people want to retire earlier, uh, and if they uh, are faced with the consequences of retiring earlier, there's no problem, with an exception of which immediately come to. So if somebody says, no, I don't want to add to the age of 65, I want to retire at the age of 60, the actuarial discount would be of the range of uh, 30 plus percent, so out of it. And so if people are willing to, how to say, have a lower pension of this amount, this is exactly what the uh, NDC system is proposing. You face a minimum retirement age, and then afterwards you can stipulate a standard retirement age to have some kind of a benchmark, an anchor, but you allow people to retire earlier. What you need to do is, however, uh, people are reacting, how to say, to information in a way that what's out there must have some kind of uh, information value, optimality, etc., following the others. So if the minimum age is 60, this age quite likely should be indexed with life expectancy because 60 now is not 60 in 10 or 20 or 30 years down the road. And this is what's going to happen in Italy and also in a number of other countries. Denmark did it. And the other thing is you don't want to let people retire to close off the poverty line. So what some countries are doing is that you can retire at the age of 60 or 61, provided that your pension is 125, 150 percent of the poverty threshold. So to make sure how to say that you don't fall out as a victim of too low pension there. Given both, yes, you should allow individuals this kind of information. And then also the information interviewing those people five years down the road and asking them whether they are happy or not that they retired so early. And uh, I mean, in Europe, this, in f this uh, retirement uh, uh, micro data is not yet as well developed as in the US, uh, and a number of uh, uh, great studies done over the last 10 years financed by the US government, uh, which shows how to say that uh, people who retire too early, how to say, in many cases, they regret it that they did. And if they would be able to redo it three or four years later, uh, they would be able to do it. So there's a role for government of information. You still have the decision, but you have to talk to your peers who did it. Uh, they said 30 years, 35 years, or along these lines in front of the DV is not fun.
even if uh, Milano is playing, you know, or whatever the local <laughs> football game. <laughs> Bene, se non ci sono altre domande io ringrazierei. Ah, prego, c'è una replica. Io vedo giornalmente i lavoratori, per cui le informazioni che ho sono veramente, veramente molto diverse. E trovo persone che eh, vorrebbero andare in pensione per motivi propri, che ce ne sono tantissime, persone che hanno iniziato a lavorare a 15 anni e quindi dopo 40 anni che lavorano vorrebbero anche poter starsene un po' tranquille e fare un qualcosa di diverso. È vero che quelle persone che, sono in, eh, che adesso hanno lavorato 40 anni iniziando a 15 anni non hanno potuto studiare e quindi tutto il periodo che generalmente si dedica a quella che è la formazione di una persona, queste persone non l'hanno avuta e obiettivamente eh, dicono ok a, a 55-60 anni vorremmo recuperare quella parte della vita che non abbiamo vissuto. Per cui io non credo che tutti quanti vorrebbero starsene al lavoro fino a 70 anni, assolutamente no glielo garantisco, soprattutto le donne che eh, hanno che anche se lei non, di, non condivide con me questa affermazione hanno i carichi della famiglia non solo la loro ma quella dei figli con tutte le problematiche che hanno i giovani al giorno d'oggi per poter trovare Beh. lavoro e anche perché lo stipendio di lavoratori giovani chiaro. al giorno d'oggi è veramente esiguo, per cui io non condivido assolutamente questa sua visione Ecco, se ci sono, perché penso okay. che andiamo verso la conclusione, se ci sono altre domande, perché così facciamo concludere, ah ce ne sono altre, allora io aggiungerei di modo che... Sì, sì eh, salve, io lavoro all'Inps, mm -hmm. eh, Imp una volta, poi è stato soppresso mm -hmm. col, con la riforma del governo Monti e volevo mh, fare una considerazione e poi porre un quesito al professore. E, Diciamo che la, la, la lunghezza in cui è stato doveva essere introdotto secondo la legge.